Hi there. How are you doing? <laughs> so as it comes to this conference, it's not only my first conference in Africa, but it's also the first conference in which I'm going to have the keynote, apparently, um, which I'm very proud of. And it is my honor to be able to tell you a bit about myself um, and hopefully uh, encourage you, inspire you to be yourself um, and challenge things, try out things that you wanted to try out for a long time but never did so far. Um, so I would say let's get started. Um, this talks about from fun to business. So um, we are talking a bit about open source software, of course, somehow. Um, and then a bit also about freelancing and about uh, startups and the whole entrepreneurial scene. Um, and I hope it's uh, that I, I think there's going to be something very interesting for everyone. Um, but let's let's get started at like how everything got started for me, for myself. So this is my personal story. Um, and everything started with a project called Yafos. Um, it's kind of the stupidest project you could ever imagine. Um, it is a huge sink for time, um, and there's no reasonable output. Um, so I'm going to show it to you. Oh, yeah. So it's uh, an operating system kernel, which <laughs> has a green screen, so it's obviously eco-friendly, and it does sound. Uh, using the PC speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and you have no idea how many months I've worked on that and how happy I was when I saw the first A on the screen rendered properly. <laughs> um, and what happened from Yafos um, was like this This is a thing where I wasted a lot of time, I had a lot of fun, and they learned a lot. Um, and also during that time I got involved into a Google Summer of Code. Uh, who knows, who does not know what a Google Summer of Code is? Everybody knows it. No, you, okay, very quick. <laughs> Google Summer of Code is a, a scholarship from Google and they fund students to work on open source projects. Um, Google Summer of Code is also a very, very good excuse for a person like me, uh, feeling like a stupid newcomer, to go to a mentor from an organization and ask them, hey, do you want to be my mentor? Do you want to help me get started? Um, because in the, in the beginning I was very intimidated. I was trying to get started on Octave, which is this mathematical MATLAB alternative thing, and I asked questions as, and nobody would respond and uh, I, f I felt treated very poorly and that was most likely not because they didn't like me but just because they had other stuff to do. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but they're, they're, uh, it is really, really hard for a newcomer to get started into open source and Google Summer of Code provided me the perfect ex uh, excuse to bother someone with every question I had. Um, and I learned a lot about commit messages, writing good code. Um, and that was a really, really important experience for me that is relevant for everything that's coming because it got me so interested in Git workflows and automation. We see people here, someone was here with an uh, keep calm and automate everything t-shirt. Yeah, great, that's great. That's how you do it. <laughs> um, so wh what's, what's the takeaway here? Uh, those projects, they were super, super fun, and I learned a lot. Um, even though not all of those projects, for example, the kernel, are super meaningful, they made me what I am today, and they are relevant for everything that started from there. Um, and I just did it because it was fun for me and it fulfilled me. Um, and I, I want to encourage you to do that too, because nobody knows what's coming from that. So let's talk, let's, let's look at this kernel. The project that actually arised from this was Koala. Um, Koala is an open source project. Um, it started out of the kernel because I asked my friend, hey, do you want to join me? Here's this cool thing, it's written in C and assembly. You can try out all the stuff that you ever wanted to do. He was like, you're kidding me, right? 
I'm, I'm not going to start writing on a kernel with you. Um, so he started writing a code analysis tool because my code sucked a lot. Um, and that was Koala. And at some point, people started joining us. Um, but a lot of people might ask now, what is Koala? Um, so I'm going gi to give a very quick introduction. Koala is a tool that finds problems in your source code, much like a linter. And sometimes it has fixes for those problems as well. Um, so if you have uh, all those traditional linters, uh, and maybe your custom bash scripts in your company, um, then you have all those different opportunities on how you might want to use every one of those tools. Um, and connecting all those bubbles, even in a presentation, wasn't fun. So I didn't do it. So the question is, why do people write code for every single of those connections? Why do people write an own extension for every editor, for every linter? Um, and that was obviously not how Koala was created, but eventually we, we found out that's why it is useful. Um, and my friend wrote this modularly designed code analysis thing, and eventually we just found out, well, what we've built is this. We've built an API where we can wrap existing tools, where we can write new code analysis, and we get the whole user interface for free by just having a clear API. Uh, currently, it provides code analysis for more than 60 languages, uh, and this is roughly, uh, this is like how you configure it, so you can have multiple sections in an any like configuration, and you just tell it, hey, I want to check my C code for security and annotation, and Python code for unused code, and PEP8. Um, but this project was very astonishing, um, because we just started coding, and eventually just started taking off, and we had more and more uh, not only stars, but actually we had more forks than stars, and we had lots and lots of contributors. Um, and I want to share how, like, why this happened, and how we managed to attract contributors to something as boring as static code analysis. Um, so there's a few guidelines that I want to share if you're willing to start an open source project, and if you want to make it easy for new people to get started. Um, so the first thing, um, and most effective thing, is providing issue levels. So if you have a newcomer, that newcomer will first struggle with learning Git, and at the same time having to learn about your project and the technicalities of your project. Um, and that is a lot of complication that is very difficult to do at once. And what we've done, although we didn't know it at that time, but again, we just tried out a few things, um, is that we had difficulty labels and we had this difficulty newcomer issues. Some know it as up for grabs or right now we have Hacktoberfest, right? Um, and those issues would be like a typo. Change this to that. It's very, very simple. Everybody can go there and do it and will have no imposter syndrome excuse to not do it. Um, and he can just go there, read the documentation, and learn about the Git workflows, get into the communities. Um, and when you take this step further, you can actually provide difficulty newcomer, low, medium, high, and so on, and provide the people a ladder to climb up on. Um, you obviously need newcomer documentation, so you can have a step-by-step -step instruction for newcomers to get started. Um, and the first thing that we have in those documentation is people get on the chat and talk to us. Because we want to grow together as a community um, and we want to talk to you. So what we've noticed is, um, or what I've noticed in my Google Summer of Code at GNOME, um, that newcomers are coming onto the chat and they're asking a question and five minutes later they're just dropping out because they didn't get a response. And sometimes it's good if you see there's a question. Maybe you can't answer it right now or you don't have time. It's just good to tell them, hey, I don't have time right now, but I will respond to you in two weeks or something. Um, and that will give them an immediate response and that it shows them that there's somebody who cares for them right now. Uh, and especially on IRC, they will at least see something instead of never coming back and never getting an email. Um, 
So responding fast made a huge difference for us. Um, we also had a uh, guy who did a Google Summer of Code um, who started just doing uh, non-code discussions and he, he primarily did jokes. That was kind of his job. Um, and he, a lot of, in, on a lot of conferences, uh, he has done lightning talks on him being the secretary of Off Topic. And he's always there, he's always with us. Although he, I, I'm not even sure if he did a lot of code. Um, but he was there and I think that was one of the best things for the community that happens. Um, so if you build your community, I do recommend a lot, allow no, no, non-code discussions and make space for that because that helps you growing together as a community. And we've also heard that in the, in the lightning talk, it helps you getting together on a more personal level, um, showing that you're all fitting together and growing as a community. Um, then there's this topic of code review. And when you ask uh, newcomers uh, or, or people on, a project, what do you think about code review? Most people say, no, nah, it's boring or um, I, I don't like it because I get told what's wrong with my code. And it's really hard to counter that, uh, that kind of thinking because effectively code review is some th someone telling you what's wrong with your source code. Um, and we found that a way how we can change that is to let newcomers review code as well. Because the newcomers have a fresh perspective on every pull request of the experienced members and the other way around. And this way they are sitting on both sides of the table and they eventually get, uh, and actually relatively early get, that code review is a gift that we give to a person because we don't do a code review if we don't think that code is worth my time. Um, so if people, new people, learn to review code ASAP, then they also uh, experience how that works from the other side and they can value it way better. And there's one thing that I'm, I'm going to pick up again and again and again. Um, we need the feedback, not only in the code review, but also for our processes. And if we want to be nice to new people, then there's no step-by-step -step instruction similar to what I'm trying to sell you here. That's, that's not the truth, right? We all know that. And we have to always get feedback from people. How is this working out for you and what can we do better? Um, so to sum it up, um, there, are th there are some methods on how you can grow your open source community. Um, they are quite time intensive, I'm not going to lie. I mean, there's, there's always a catch to it. Um, and you have to decide, do you want to spend your time on developing your next big feature or do you want to spend your time on growing your community? Um, and this whole idea of how we grow in this community is uh, very similar to the entrepreneurial thinking, um, to this startup thinking which you hear in Silicon Valley and all those buzzwords around because those people are obsessed with growth versus having the best thing right now. It's about how can we become bigger uh, instead of how can we become better. And there's a careful balance that one has to find there. Um, and in our case, I guess uh, Koala is a very educational project as well. Um, the pace we're moving forward is uh, it's okay, but it's not super fast, given that we have actually had more than 500 contributors over time. But a lot of them are not very experienced, but most of them uh, we see around the channel uh, thanking us because they have learned a lot through that journey. So what happens if you grow a community, eventually it becomes bigger and you have to review more and more code. and the existential question some, someone comes up like, I'm working 30, 40 hours a week in my free time on this project. I have to live off something. Um, and very luckily, I got the opportunity to become a freelancer. Um, and I had a contract that uh, got me secure income for a year or so. And during that year, I tried, uh, I just tried to find out how can I make a 
nice working business model where I can write as much open source software as possible. Um, and I, I built this website which where I was trying to sell code quality sessions because Koala was all about code quality um, and I had, I had this one consultancy where I saved the company 2 million euro revenue per year. Sounds great, doesn't it? I just, I just walked through them and I talked with them two weeks about their processes um, because they were transforming from a startup to a company and it's nothing inhumane that ever happens. It's just having one thing that you know about and that you tell others about. So, um, long story short, I, I had this consultancy thing and I had this idea and I just put it up as a website and nobody, ev nobody ever cared. Um, so this was like totally not working. Um, and there's this idea of we can, let's fail as fast as we can. This is a failed idea. This never worked. Um, so we just do another one. Um, and this, uh, I'm not going to show the website because I don't want to do advertisement, but um, we started doing uh, products for startups and building software for startups. And out of a sudden, we got an immediate response from all the people around me because um, I knew the people on the target group very well. Um, and we were knew, knowing very well what we were doing. Um, so it's, uh, it's all about trying out a lot of things, failing often, um, and accepting it if something's just gone wrong. So after, um, or actually during these experiments, um, we were also looking into how can we eventually grow a business out of our little open source project. And we started working on Gitmate, which at that time was a code analysis tool for GitHub. So the idea was to automate everything. We had this newcomer process and we had lots of newcomers. And they were all making pull requests and we had to point out very simple stuff. So let's write a bot about it. We have Koala, a code analysis tool, we can use it. Um, and we wrote a service that would automatically tell you, hey, your, your pull request is not ready, you have two new issues, um, and those are your issues and here's a patch to fix it. And everybody was like, yeah, this is great, you should do it, it's awesome, I will buy it immediately. And when we, when we actually talked further with the people, they were like, yeah, but maybe, maybe in half a year. I'll do it later. Um, and everybody was super excited, but nobody really wanted to know right now where their, their bugs are. And there's, there's actually studies that show if you, um, if you take like a random person from a company and you ask them, do you want to know about one critical security issue in your software or not? Then it's actually not that low of a likelihood that they will say, no, I don't want to know. Um, and we did a lot of interviews with uh, more than 100 software developers and we figured that out eventually, um, that what we've built there in years of work, um, nobody's gonna buying it and, and this is not working out and this was a super hard thing for us to accept. And again, this is this fail f as fast as we can thing. This was this, this stupid business guy sitting to my left in the office who actually made us check if this is actually working. We would have been so happy if we had just done it and failed the business. Um, <laughs> but this way we actually get a chance. Um, and then the, the, the art is finding the overlap between what you love and what the market wants. So we kept on trying and we analyzed all the stuff that we have talked to the people about. Um, and we, it still doesn't have anything to do with post-its. I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> but <laughs> we, we figured out our original idea sucks. And, and what we did afterwards was uh, we found out that, especially in open source projects, there's a real problem when it comes to issues. Um, we talked to people from the Atom project 
and they estimated uh, that they, quote, spend uh, 20 hours every single day on reading and triaging issues. The GitLab project gets a new issue every 15 minutes, and that is all text, chunks and chunks of text that the, every, that the developers have to read and try it. Um, and eventually we, we started uh, building our machine learning algorithms to create our little Gitmate bot. Uh, we changed our logo. Um, so this was our old logo and people were like, okay, this reminds me of a very bad dream with ants cr uh, crawling up my nose. Uh, <laughs> so we were like, okay, this, this is not good for our company. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> let's, let's take this one. And, and we, we consulted with the designer and we made our little robot that helps you with everything on your Git repository. Um, so we started building this. Um, and wh what you see here is, for example, a report. It's, uh, we, we basically try to let people see the value before they actually use it. Because if you, if you give such tool access to your repository and turn it on, you first need a really hard data on how it's going to work and what value you are going to get. So if you're trying to make a product, think about how you can get through the perceived value of it. And in this case, it's, um, it's actually this, uh, we're still working on this report, so it's not perfect. Um, I would actually love to have a heading above which says like, hey, we would have saved you 240 hours. And then there comes the breakdown of we would have set so many labels automatically, we would have found so many duplicates, you would have, you, you have wasted uh, 3,200 whatever comments on issues that are in the end duplicates and where discussions are wasted. And that is a thing, uh, you don't only need to provide value, but you need to give your clients the impression as well and you need to make them accept that you provide value. Um, so I have been talking a bit about uh, us interviewing the people and I wanted to share a bit about how that works because uh, if you ask suggested questions you will always get a yes. So if I, if I go to someone and say hey you like code analysis right? <laughs> And, and everybody will be like, yeah, code analysis is the greatest thing ever. I will pay you so much for this. No, 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 that's, that's not helpful, right? This is the, the worst information you can have for building your business. Um, so what you can actually do is, um, hey, code analysis really sucks, right? There's, there's always false positives. Um, it tells you what all you're doing wrong. And if, if, if the one in front of you is then, yeah, 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 probably too. Then you know <laughs> that's a bad idea. And it's actually way more likely if you ask it like that. So it's, um, if you're curious about creating your own company and being an entrepreneur, check your assumptions and speak to people from your client group, especially if you have a high initial investment and just try out things, put up websites, see how they do, uh, talk to people and see if you can get reactions. Um, another kind of interview is the solution interview. So let's assume you have validated that there is a problem, then you want to know is your solution actually solving a problem? So what we do in our case, for example, is we say, hey, we're finding duplicate issues in your issue tracker. How is this affecting your workflow? And that way, the person in front of me has to get creative and has to think like, how is this changing my workflow? And if there is like a real change in the workflow that where we can see that there's value in it, then we know that this works out and otherwise we know it doesn't. And that is the feedback loop again. We need it everywhere. We need it in our code. We need it for every type of business we want to do and we need it for ourselves. We need it for the dopamine kick that we had in the first keynote. Um, and we needed to know whenever we are doing something that just annoys people. So, for example, if you don't like this keynote, please tell me about it and tell me why. Because I'm very happy to do a better job next time. And if you don't tell me, you're actually uh, you're taking the opportunity from me to get better.
Um, yeah, misordered slides, I'm sorry. Um, if you are curious about uh, the whole issue triaging topic, because I cut it a little short, um, there's some content, but only today on dailydrip.com, um, because they bought the video from us. We don't have the rights to give it out. Um, but if you look on their website today, it will be free. And eventually they will uh, put it on the, on the behind a paywall tomorrow. Um, so, to sum up, uh, allow failures, embrace failures, try out stuff. We're, we're not uh, doctors, right? If, if something fails in our test systems or, or wherever, that's not a problem. Um, change your ideas, um, get feedback, and most importantly, keep the fun and just do it. And I think um, that every one of you is able to do um, something like that if he just wants it um, and, and really, really goes forward and actually does it. Um, so this is my main message. Have more fun. Um, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you do questions or? I don't know. Cool. Thank you very much. And that's a. Ah, there we go. Thank you very much. And that's a wonderful note to um, end the conference on. Um, do you have any questions about the talk? First one's always a bit difficult. <laughs> um, so tell me, how do you stay motivated? What, please? How do you stay motivated? I, yeah, um, it's, it's an interesting question because this is like this uh, kind of burnout thing that you can have if you get into too many projects or if you, if you get into one project too much. Um, so for me, I, I like to switch the way how I do things or the, the things that I'm doing. Um, for example, um, in the beginning, I was like a pure coder. I coded my kernel. I, I was knowing everything about those interrupts and the global descriptor table and everything. Um, then I started uh, coding on Koala together with a friend now. And we started doing teamwork and we started figuring out how do we work together. Um, then we had the Google Summer of Code, next step. We had, w we had to work together as an open source project. And I learned so much about Git. Um, then I had built my own community. I, I began to teach people about Git. Um, we start, I started more and more doing code review. Um, eventually, I only did code review. Um, eventually, I tried to manage that people would do code review to each other. Um, and now I'm getting into this whole entrepreneurial scene. Um, so even if I'm staying in the same area or in the same project, um, I am constantly switching to things where I can learn from and which are fun for me. Um, and sometimes that also means that I have to abandon things where I'm no longer super motivated on. For example, my Google Summer of Code project was at GNOME. Um, the GNOME people are a super nice community, uh, very similar to the Python, Python people. Um, and I got started there, I did my project, and eventually I lost the motivation, and I, I kind of uh, jumped out in the end. And that, was, that was kind of sad, because uh, I put time into it, and I wanted to help them. But if I'm not really motivated, then I, I don't feel like I can make a significant difference. And then I ju can just go to another place where I can be of more help. Was it helpful? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
So, uh, did you have any other open source projects that you used for inspiration or that you found uh, characteristics or things which you enjoyed and used in your own projects? And any mentors in the open source community? What, how did you find inspiration? Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest inspiration was the Google Summer of Code and my mentor because he took a lot of time um, and he taught me about those Git workflows that, that I'm still uh, very uh, excited about. Um, I also do, for example, I do workshops for companies where I discuss Git workflows. And that is, that is all thanks to my mentor, Zishan, uh, from GNOME. Um, there's, I'm not sure if there's like any single inspirational person that I had, but I just gathered what I liked and what I didn't like. Um, for example, for this newcomer process, um, there, was, there was no project that, that I knew of that did that. There was just my experience that I had, and my experience was I had to go to someone, and that is really hard as a newcomer because you're like, no, no, I'm, I'm doing this wrong. I'm just annoying them, right? Always, always being annoying. Um, and f out, of, out of that thing, we kind of composed our whole newcomer process and then together refined it with more and more feedback from them. So the first thing would be, hey, you, we tell you to contact us, to, to write to us, and if you, if you don't like, go do that step, then you're doing it wrong and not the o other way around. Um, yeah, I don't know. So it's just like tons of input from all sorts of people. Um, for example, at conferences, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm really sorry to say that I, I don't go to talks um, because I, I'm here to meet the people and I want to meet every single person that I want to learn from and, and with every single person. And that, that is the greatest thing that I can do here um, because I can watch a talk afterwards. Um, but I, I cannot meet that person again. Was it helpful? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Anyone else want to get a mug? <laughs> or are you out of mugs? <laughs> okay, um, as a jungle gun in April, there was an issue of uh, how to make money with uh, open source. Mm -hmm. You're working full time on Kuala, is it? What, well, please? Are you these days, are you working full time on Koala? Uh, I'm, I'm working full time on Gitmate. Gitmate. So, Koala was the open source project where we, st where everything started, kind of, and then we s we started thinking about how can we build a business, and we built Gitmate, um, and then we figured that the software that we did at that point wasn't that good, and. Uh, now, or long, sh long story short, we're working on Gitmate, um, and for that, we there, there's some good funding programs in Germany, um, which allows us to work on Gitmate full time with three people right now. Um, we also managed to land an initial client who uh, paid us twenty thousand euros, um, which was a big deal, um, and that allows us to work on almost completely open source software. I wanted to know, are you making money with open source? Hmm? How, how do you make money with open source? Or was this a question? Oh. Um, I mean, right now we're mostly running on government grants. Um, but uh, we, also, we also had this pilot client, pilot client I mentioned. And for them it was like, we told them, hey, we, we can build this piece of software. It's providing value for you. And we are going to open source it. Uh, and if you, if you join in and help us doing that, everybody gets these benefits. And we tailor it to uh, your specific uh, workspace a bit. And, and that worked very, very well. Um, if you look at open source business models, there's a ton of different ones. Um, you can go for like the pure open source business model. And I think a good example, for example, is Sentry. Who knows Sentry? Okay, uh, so Sentry is an error tracking um, system. So whenever your web application throws an exception, it gets reported right into Sentry, and then you have like an issue tracker, 
uh, where you can see which exception happened, how often, and when, including the tracebacks and all the local variables, etc. So they have a really, really great tool, and the software is completely open source. So you could just go and self-host it. Um, but what they, they are pretty much, they seem to be the default uh, error tracking system in Python. And apparently there's uh, more than enough companies that are asking them for s providing support. Um, so they, are have, they have a support-driven business model uh, based on a completely open source project. Um, and the alternative is that you keep small parts of your source code closed. Um, for example, we have uh, one or 200 lines of code that are closed source. It's like nothing. Um, but this is, they are our algorithms, and they allow us to go to an investor and tell like, no, 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 we're not open source. Because we, um, what we do is all closed source, right? Our, it's our, our core algorithm, so you don't need to worry. And it's a huge deal for them, um, and it still allows us to keep all our libraries and all our frameworks uh, completely open source. And you could go, you could go and watch and, and look at almost all of our source code, and you can build your own automation for GitHub and GitLab in uh, in a matter of hours with what we've built. Anybody else have a question? Um, or any last questions before we move on? Okay, cool. In that case, um, we'll hand over to David for the closing remarks. And thank you very much for that talk. Thank you.